Hi Grace Church Online, great to be with you today and I'm really excited to be able to speak through uh, some of the scriptures in Philippians. My title today as you can see is to know Christ and um, yeah I'm really excited about this. Philippians would be one of my favorite books of the Bible and what I find really interesting is the Apostle Paul is the guy who planted the Church of Philippians and then he was later supported by the Church of Philippians to go out as a missionary. And this book we call Philippians was a letter and it's written back to the church from Paul and it's a result of Epaphroditus, the pastor of the Philippian church, going to Rome and visiting their missionary, Paul, in prison. And he takes to him some gifts and he takes to him some medicines and, and some support and certainly some moral support and things like that. Now Paul's writing the letter and he's sending it back with Epaphroditus back to the church in Philippi. I, I love this. I, I love that sense of, and I don't know another book in scriptures that really has the, a missionary and the church plant of being the same guy and interacting with the church like this. So today I'm going to be speaking from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. And I want to break that down into three different parts. From verses 1 to 3 is Paul's warning. From verses 4 to 6 is Paul's testimony. And from verse uh, 7 to 14 is Paul's goals or Paul's focus. Now, last week I know Paul preached from uh, chapter 2 where he spoke about Epaphroditus. And Paul describes Epaphroditus in some great words, in some really encouraging words. He says, he's my brother, my fellow worker, a great a fellow soldier and your messenger. And Paul says, honour men like him. So as an aside now, I just want to say this is the best thing that Paul could have said. I can experience this. I can relate to this. I know as Greg has come to Nepal with us a couple of different times and has been involved in our church planting work in Nepal, uh, he's been a tremendous encouragement to me personally and an encouragement to many others as well as he's come to personally look at and observe the work and encourage the work. Honour men like this. In chapter 3, verse 2, Paul starts with a warning and he describes some people. These are Judaizers. <coughs> They'd come to the church and they were teaching that in addition to faith in Christ, Gentile believers should be circumcised and fulfill some other parts of the Jewish law. Now, notice the contrast. We spoke of how Paul spoke of Epaphroditus in such warm terms and, and fellowship style terms. But look at the way he speaks to these men. It's really strong language. In verse 2, he says, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Really, he says, they're dangerous like a rabid dog. He's saying they're wicked because they're teaching and they think they can accomplish something in their own strength. And they are really religious hypocrites. You know, Paul's warning is to discern truth from error and particularly to discern anyone who would add anything to the complete and finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. The Passion Translation puts verse 3 in this way, and I, I love the way this is worded in the Passion Translation. Because these men who'd come, they were claiming that physical circumcision was something, or observing these elements of the law was something. And Paul says here, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation, he says, we've already experienced heart circumcision. And it's far greater than physical circumcision. He says, we worship God in the power and freedom of the Holy Spirit, not in laws or religious duties. And that we are those who boast in what Christ has done and not what we can accomplish in our own strength. And that's, I, I just love the way that's worded. I love the way the Passion Translation really puts that. Paul, the apostle, had been where these Judaizers are at. He'd been there. He's basically saying, I've lived in your subculture. I've spent time uh, trying to make myself pleasing to God with these so-called qualifications or accomplishments. But Christianity is not like that. Christianity doesn't work that way. You know, Paul had some impressive qualifications prior to salvation, and he lists them off there. He's almost ticking the boxes, and he says, you think you're something? Let me tell you where I was at. Circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite of the elect of God from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, proud in personal devotions over his contemporaries, zealous even to stamp out any opposition to Judaism, 
righteous, a Pharisee, blameless in his own eyes and the eyes of those around him. Paul's saying, when it comes to religiosity, I was at the top of the pile. You know, yet when Paul met the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road, he came to Jesus the only way that anyone can come to Jesus. He came as a helpless sinner who needed a saviour. Now, think about Paul's conversion for a moment. You might recall in Acts it records that and Paul was uh, on the Damascus Road and a, a light from heaven came around him and the Lord spoke to him there and then it says that Paul was struck blind and he was led by the hand into Damascus and he was blind for three days. I think Paul had some thinking to do in that time. I think Paul had some thinking to do about who he was before God, who he really was before God. And in that time frame, God was doing some deep surgery within Paul and changing his thinking about who God was, about who Paul was before God, and how to come to God. So in verse 7, Paul sums up his incredible conversion and speaks really about his complete 180 degrees turnaround in his perspective regarding his religious accomplishments and qualifications. Let me read it to you from verse 7. But whatever were gains for me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, and I consider them garbage, he says, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own which comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. He says the righteousness that comes from God and is on the basis of faith. Paul realised that he'd been trusting in the wrong things. What things, the, some things that he thought were assets in his life were actually liabilities. That impressive list of what made him righteous before God he realised they weren't assets to him, they were liabilities. He uses this accounting term here and uh, any accountant or mum will probably recognise these terms. What's the difference between an asset and a liability? Well, it's easy. An asset is anything that puts money into your pocket. A liability is anything that takes money out of your pocket. Now let's do a quick quiz. If I come home and I announce to Donna I'm going to buy a sailboat, is it an asset or a liability? David's up here. Dave, what do you reckon? They're both liabilities. They're both liabilities. I'm a liability as well now. <laughs> That's probably true. What about golf clubs? Liability. liability. Okay. What about marijuana? Medicinal? <laughs> probably a liability. <laughs> well, no. What about an investment property? Well, that'd be an asset, wouldn't it? So Paul's wake-up call came to him as if he's a cigarette junkie and he's reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He realised, man, I'm pouring out all of this money into something that's going nowhere and is a huge, huge liability. He realises that the things he'd believed in his, all his life that were gains or assets were in fact liabilities or losses. And he now describes those things as rubbish. Some translations speak about... Uh, use the translation of horse dung or dog dung. Uh, and it describes Paul's incredible 180 degrees change. He had spent his entire life, up until the time he met the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to be somebody, trying to do whatever was needed to be seen to be acceptable, trying to make something of himself through his own efforts. And friends, there's always been a deception in religion. And it remains one of the biggest obstacles of Christianity for millions and millions of people the world over. So many people who think, oh, I can't be a Christian because I can't do those things. Whatever those things are in the minds of somebody, they tick them off, I, I couldn't do that. And they're the things. The challenge is it's possible to know about Jesus and not know him. And it affects believers, it affects unbelievers. It's very possible to have a degree in theology and know about God, but not know him in a personal, vital, intimate relationship. 
is more than possible. I think of a man named Lance Latham. He was a wonderful man of God who started Awana International. And as a result of Awana, many hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of young people came to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Lance Latham is a young man who had a brilliant mind and he was able, in fact, he had memorised more than half the New Testament and could quote it verbatim. And he realised at that point that he was still not a Christian. He knew about God, he knew about Jesus, but he didn't know him. He didn't know him personally, he didn't know him intimately, he didn't experience Jesus and the power of Jesus in his life day to day. <coughs> This is the trap within Christianity today. To believe that I, because of accumulated knowledge about the Bible, sometimes about churchianity, I'm a mature Christian. And it's not correct. Some people learn to play the church game, but it doesn't mean that they are maintaining a vital, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus day to day. The lesson for us here goes to the heart of what precisely we are trusting in for our salvation and for our walk with God. Are there things that you consider assets in your life that are actually liabilities to your walk of faith? Maybe your health, maybe money, maybe your family standing, maybe your youth, maybe your knowledge, your intelligence. These things are all things people trust in and have confidence in for themselves. But these things go. Health it can be gone in an instant. Money is an illusion of security and of happiness. Family standing, there's no guarantees there. And youth, let me tell you, it won't last forever. Eventually, gravity wins every single time. Youth, <laughs> you know, I think of a young man named Adam Roth. He was a wonderful young Christian man. And uh, at 19 year old, he was in a car accident. And then he was a quadriplegic and he lasted another maybe 15 months before he passed away. It was tragic. We think we've got youth until it's gone. We think we've got our health until it's gone. We think we've got the intelligence and some people are saying, well, I'm too intelligent to really believe the Bible. I've heard that. Maybe you have also. There was a guy in, Indi in Nepal who spoke to me about uh, the intelligence of not believing in God. And he said, you know what? The concept that God doesn't exist is like saying that my parents don't exist. <laughs> it's an interesting concept there. The more you trust in these things, the more they'll keep you away from an intimate, genuine, authentic relationship with Jesus. No amount of external success or accolades can replace intimacy with God. I heard the story of a preacher who uh, had a dream and he dreamed that he died and he was in front of the pearly gates and of course when you're in front of the pearly gates of course Peter is there with a big book and uh, that was the case in this guy's dream and uh, he's ready to decide if this man, a preacher, would be allowed into heaven or not. So Porter, Peter rather gave him the surprise announcement. He said, you're going to need 100 points to get inside. Well, said the preacher proudly, I've been a minister for 47 years. That's nice, answered Peter. That'll get you one point. One point? That's all I get? Just one point for 47 years of service? That's correct, said Peter. The minister started to get concerned about the scoring system and he tried to think of other, way, other things that he'd done in his life. And he said, well, I, I visited people in prison every chance I got. One point, said Peter. He said, I developed a number of recovery programs, took part in many civic groups in our city. People loved me. One point. Now you've got three points, said Peter. Wow. He said, well, I've worked with youth. You know how hard youth can be. Surely one point, said Peter. Now you've got four points. Oh, no, cried the minister. He's in panic mode. He said, I feel so helpless, I feel so inadequate, except for the grace of God, I don't have a chance. Big smile started to come over Peter's face. Ha, ah, he said, the grace of God, well, that's worth 96 points, come on in. <laughs> you know, it's a great story, and of course, it's, um, it is a story. But it, 
illustrates and illustrates beautifully what our gains are, what we think are the gains in our life compared to the grace of God. Verse 10 and 11, he says, I want to know Christ. And these are incredible words from the Apostle Paul. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death and so somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. Friends, let me put this into perspective when Paul says, I want to know Christ. When Paul wrote this letter, he was probably entering his fourth year as a prisoner in Rome. It's been approximately 30 years since his, since his amazing conversion on the Damascus Road. And Paul's Christian journey has been tough, to say the least. He's had incredible highs and devastating lows. Now, while waiting for his head to be chopped off, Paul writes a letter about joy to a church he planted and loves, and he knows the people there love him. And what does he say? He says, I want to know Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that staggering. In a nutshell, he's saying this is the key to the genuine Christian life. There's no other key. There's no greater key. There's no greater goal. There's no greater focus within the Christian life than what he says right here. He's saying, I'm not talking about knowing about Jesus. I'm not talking about knowing the statistics or memorizing the words of Jesus or thinking of him as a great figure in human history. Paul is speaking about knowing Jesus experientially in his everyday life, where Jesus is a part of every moment of his life, where Jesus infuses power into Paul's everyday life, power to face the challenges of life, resurrection power, power to endure suffering and even a triumphant death if that's what's needed in the mind of Paul. Triumphant death, you say, what's that? Well, that's when you trust Jesus every single day until your dying breath and you die triumphantly, just like Jesus did. Paul is saying that as I, Paul, press into Jesus and experience the same kind of power that comes from Jesus' resurrection, I am enabled to live victoriously in faith. As I experience the suffering similar to the, what Jesus experienced and keep faith to the very, very end of my life, Paul is saying, I will then know Jesus as well as I possibly can. And friends, that's Paul's goal. He said, I want, to, I want to know him as well as I possibly can. What is it in this life that I need to do to know him? Really just press into him. Open your heart, open your life to him. <clears throat> Verse 12 says, not that I've already, excuse me. Verse 12 says, Not that I've already attained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Wow, I love this verse. In fact, the second part of this verse has become my personal life verse. Let me open it up a little bit. From the time that Jesus stepped into my life, I've known that God had something in mind for my life, some purpose for my life. So when I read Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, I thought, yeah, that's what I want. I was a younger man, much younger than now, when I, when I read that and when I thought about that verse uh, deeply. To take hold of of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, there's a thought here. There's a, a question that's posed as you read that verse. And um, to be honest, this is a question or a thought that's consumed most of my Christian life. The thought is, for what purpose did Jesus take hold of me? Why? What did God have in mind for me when I was 25 years old and I'd been stoned almost every day for the past eight years. And Jesus got my attention and turned my life around. What was he thinking? <laughs> what did he have in mind? And the last part of that question or thought, if you like, is 
how can I take hold of it? How can I access what God was thinking? How can I access God's purpose for my life? You know, I've always believed that God really does have a purpose and plan for every individual's life. I also knew that I would need to press in. And unless I pressed into Jesus, I'd never really discover what that plan or what that purpose was. And I knew the only way to take hold of all that God had in mind for me was to know and experience Jesus every single day. That's the only way to take hold of it. Experience him as a part of my daily life and be fully available to him. And I'm still discovering God's purpose for my life. Friends, I'm just an ordinary bloke seeking to walk with God, experiencing his power, enabling me to do what I do, and I'm still discovering what Jesus had in mind for my life. And I can say like the Apostle Paul, truly, not that I've already attained all this or been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul continues in this chapter in a very personal and a great conversational style. He says, brothers, verse 13, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of these things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. And this is where he finishes this section. I love how Paul opens himself up in this section. He says, I'm not there yet. I'm still learning. I'm still making mistakes. I'm still growing. And I can identify with Paul. I'm doing all of that. I think of a man I, I love, and uh, he's with the Lord now, and I've spoken about him before. I used to affectionately call him Uncle Ted. He was a, a good friend of ours in New Tribes Mission. And Uncle Ted in his 90s, I still remember him speaking to me and saying, well, God is not finished with, he, with me yet. He's still showing me stuff. He's still changing me. I'm still learning and I want to know him more. I can remember Uncle Ted in his 90s saying that. And I pray that I am as passionate about God and as passionate about pursuing God and chasing after God and discovering the purpose of God in my life in my 90s also. I'm still striving. When Paul says forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is in front of us, he's not saying that the past is wasted or not relevant to the future because everybody's past is a stepping stone to our learning and finding our future with the Lord Jesus Christ. However, yesterday's victories do not guarantee tomorrow's successes. Every single day we walk with the Lord Jesus, we must take steps of faith. Every single day we cannot get complacent in our walk with God. That's why it's called walking by faith. That's why it's called living by faith. And um, when do we stop living by faith? Yep, when we take our last breath. In verse 15, Paul speaks of maturity, and he speaks of it in this way, as taking a view that we are still in a race. We still have a prize to win at the end of the race. Maturity is looking to finish well, believing Jesus all the way to the grave and into eternity. And friends, I, I love, I got a, as a personal testimony, I love this unfolding journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the new ventures that God is leading me into today. You know, we're still training uh, out our 250 pastors in, who started new churches in Nepal. I love that. I love thinking of these guys, praying for these guys. Now I watch them on Zoom and uh, I know they, they're going on well. I love that. Just recently, we launched our new anti-trafficking ministry, Every Daughter Matters, to intercept girls and women at that last moment before they cross the border and are sold into slavery and prostitution. I love what God is doing. I love pursuing God and understanding more and more of what God wants out of my life and where he wants to take me every single day. I love discovering with God what he has in mind for me. When he took me by the scruff of the neck and broke my heart in love. I love discovering more of that. So... Let me close. The lessons in this, sections of, in this section of Philippians are these. 
Number one, be careful to discern the truth from error. Be careful of dogs. Do not depend on anything which will keep you from knowing and experiencing Jesus. Number three, make intimacy with Jesus a number one priority. And four, press on. Press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of you. Friends, thank you for the privilege you've given me today to be sharing with you. God bless you.